Hello, I'm glad to be with you today. Um, I'm Hugh James. I'm one of the lay ministers at St Paul's. Let's pray. King of the ages, as we study more about your kingdom today, inspire our hearts and minds and make us your obedient servants. In Jesus' name, Amen. I've been reading Bishop Tom Wright's commentary on Mark's Gospel, called Mark for Everyone. And in it, he wrote this about the centurion who was present at Jesus' crucifixion. A battle-hardened thug in Roman uniform, used to killing humans the way one might kill flies, stands before this dying young Jew and says something which in Mark's mind sends a signal to the whole world. That the kingdom has indeed come and that a new age is being born. That God has done something, the news of which will spread around the globe. The Roman centurion becomes the first sane human being in Mark's Gospel to call Jesus God's Son and mean it. Mark is ignoring the words of the demon-possessed man and also the similar words of Peter which are recorded in the other Gospels but not in his Gospel. So what did the centurion say? This fellow really was God's son. And as Jesus, God's son, hung dying on that cross, the poster pinned to the top of the cross read this, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. What a contrast a cross is with what one expects of a king. Judas, for one, had probably wanted Jesus as king of the Jews, but not like this. Today, we celebrate the feast of Christ the King. This king's reign is something that we often pray for. For instance, every time that we pray the Lord's Prayer, when we say, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. So today, we're going to take a few moments to ask ourselves what Christ the King is like, and then what is his kingdom like? And thirdly, what does Christ the King expect of his citizens? In our first reading from Ephesians 1 in verse 20, we read that by the power of God he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. The story starts with the death of Christ on that cross. Without the cross, which we were just talked about, there is no Christian message. In all the Gospels, as Jesus fixed his eyes on Jerusalem, his message to his disciples was this, that he, the Son of Man, must die and rise again. I'm not sure that the disciples understood the rise again bit at all. But like all the disciples, the Apostle Peter wanted to prevent the death that Jesus kept mentioning. Peter had even taken out his sword in the Garden of Gethsemane and cut off the high priest's 
servants here. But Jesus' response to that had been to rebuke Peter and to heal the servant. Right at the start of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist had pointed out and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the sacrifice of a lamb always involved the lamb's death in order to forgive sin. Praise be, that although the wages of sin is death, as Romans 6, 23 tells us, the gift of God is eternal life to all who believe in that sacrifice. The Jews of Jesus' day found it very hard to equate the promised Messiah, the King of the Jews, with the man dying on the cross at Calvary. And people today find it equally hard. They might find it hard to accept that God takes sin so seriously. They find the idea that Jesus died to take away sin hard to accept. There are many who reject that doctrine, which is known as the sacrificial atonement. As a result, there are many who reject Keith Gettys and Stuart Townsend's famous hymn, In Christ Alone, because they reject the line, the wrath of God was satisfied. But without that doctrine, the whole of the New Testament makes no sense at all. Truly, Christ the King is is identical with Christ the Lamb, the Christ who was the sacrificial Lamb on that cross. But praise God, that wasn't the end of the story. The verse from Ephesians 1 continues, He seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realm. Is there here an echo of the words of Jesus to the thief dying on the cross beside him? The one who had cried out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus had replied, Today you will be with me in paradise. It's a promise that is still open today to anyone who will turn to Christ and ask for his forgiveness. Is there anyone here who is listening to this sermon who hasn't turned to Christ and asked for his forgiveness? If you haven't, would now be a suitable time to do so? If that answers the question, What is Christ the King like? And we've answered the sacrifice for sin on the cross and the Lord who has been raised for glory. What is the kingdom like? It's a kingdom where all the earthly priorities are reversed. Not the pomp, arrogance and success of earthly kingdoms. It's a kingdom with the two laws, those highlighted by Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and mind. And the second, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. The modern world often sees the second as very commendable even if it doesn't obey it. But that was not the first law. That was the second. And how often does the modern world give any priority to the first, the worship of 
had obedience to God, let alone as a first priority. But Christ's kingdom is a kingdom which is the antithesis of modern, of modern cultures. It's a kingdom which features those people and circumstances found in the Beatitudes. The poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted because of righteousness, those who are, ins are insulted and persecuted and falsely accused because of their faith in Christ. It turns the world's priorities upside down. How many of those characteristics featured in the recent USA presidential contest? I'm not ashamed to be called an evangelical because I believe in the importance of sharing the evangel, the good news, the good news of Christ's love for people, his love for others, and to share that with others. But I was totally ashamed of the way that it was being used in the American elections to support attitudes which were totally in contrast to those of Christ's kingdom. So if the kingdom is that of the underdog, what are the ways of the citizens of the kingdom? How are they expected to behave? We've already mentioned the laws of the kingdom towards God, love, and towards neighbour, love. Our second lesson highlighted the teaching of Jesus of what's expected of his followers, or his, of the citizens, in greater detail. Nowhere does this teaching suggest that it replaces Christ's sacrifice for sin on the cross as a way of entry into eternal life but it gives great detail as to what will be expected of us as members of the church, as citizens of the kingdom. If we want to serve the king, we must serve those that he's created. We must not brush aside the poor, the hungry, the thirsty. We cannot excuse ourselves by saying, that's someone else's responsibility. I know that we cannot possibly respond to every need. There are so many in this world. But if we see a need, then it's up to us to respond to it. And our passage gives us the encouragement to realise that whatever we do to help our neighbour, we do it to serve our King, Christ the King. Traditionally, we've put up statutes to honour our kings and benefactors after their death. But how much better it would have been to have given them in life something that they really wanted. In this teaching, Jesus tells us how we really can give him something. Give Christ the King what he really wants. And those who are really his should find this attitude so natural that they won't even realise that they're doing it for him. They're doing it because that is what one does in this kingdom. It's the culture of the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't see feeding the hungry giving a drink to the thirsty, providing clothing for those in need as an attractive option. The alternative is stark. If our love for the king doesn't lead us to do those things, 
Jesus warned us that the king will say, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was ill and in prison, and you did not look after me. Truly, I tell you, that whatever you did not do, for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away into eternal punishment. May these never be words that we hear, but the righteous, Jesus promises, will enter into eternal life, the presence of Christ the King. Amen.